Welcome to the Get Fit Guys Quick and Dirty Tips to Get Moving and Shape Up. My name is Brock Armstrong, and I'm the Get Fit Guy. Biomechanist Katie Bowman, a leader in the movement movement, has written a new book to teach us the critical role of movement to the human body. I mean, it's basically a nutrient, don't you know? And more importantly, how we can get our kids moving again. That's right. My guest on today's episode is biomechanist and best-selling author Katie Bowman. And like I said, she has written another book, and it is called Grow Wild, The Whole Child, Whole Family, Nature-Rich Guide to Moving More. And this time, it is all about getting kids and their families moving more together, outside. Now, Katie's been on the Get Fit Guy podcast before talking about how walking is the superfood of movement and also giving us some advice about how to choose a coach. Now, I also quote her on a very regular basis, pretty much whenever I sound the alarm of how human movement is currently at an all-time low. In her new book, she highlights how our children are currently facing both a movement and a nature deficiency. They are both spending more time indoors and moving less than any other generation throughout human history. As we and our kids turn more frequently to the modern comforts and conveniences of tech-based solutions, many tasks that once required head-to-toe use of our muscles and bones can be done with a poke and a swipe. Without even really noticing it, we've gotten rid of the movement-rich environment our physical, mental, and environmental health depend on, but we haven't gotten rid of our biology's need for it. The good news is, as Katie will highlight for us in a moment, while the problem seems quite impossible, the solution is actually quite simple and fun. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Katie, she is an internationally recognized biomechanist, author, and science communicator with both the skill and the passion for reintroducing movement into people's everyday lives. Now, Katie has earned an international reputation for educating the general population on alignment and load science, and as a result, has helped thousands to reduce pain, increase bone density, and improve metabolic health. What I most enjoy about Katie and her life's work is her radical counterculture health directives that just happen to be based on hard science. And to that point, I actually started the conversation off by asking Katie why she calls movement counterculture, especially when it relates to a child's life. Something is counterculture when it's a practice not done by most people. Movement is counterculture then because the bulk of us are sedentary. Even if most got regular exercise, which most don't, the culture would still be sedentary in the sense that our society is largely mechanized. We use machines to do the movements for most of what we need, so transportation, food, entertainment, etc. Humans used to get all the things we needed by moving our own bodies, and now we don't. This is one of the reasons children are moving less and less. As we keep building environments for humans where there is no movement required, then there is nothing left to move us or, more importantly, our kids. Most adults grew up in a time that was more dynamic than this time, but children born into this time will set this low amount of movement as their baseline, and then their children will be born into a culture with less movement still, which leaves us with this conundrum. Society doesn't require that we move, but our bodies do. Society is concerned with how little today's kids move while simultaneously reducing their movement. So in this way, we are all working against ourselves each day. Now, in your new book, Grow Wild, which is available right now, you wrote this. The single thing kids practice the most at school isn't reading or math, it's sitting in a chair. Now, aside from making kids do what I did when I was a kid, which is doze off at my desk constantly, what are the consequences of this sitting in a chair phenomenon? In short, humans become really good at sitting at a young age and are now in the habit of sitting in a certain way for just about everything. 
the consequences are the same thing that makes sitting so easy on us. So first of all, our anatomy becomes better suited for sitting than other things. That's why when we start to move more or exercise regularly, it's so hard. It's not just starting a psychological habit. We have to readapt our anatomy to moving. So we say you should add some weight-bearing exercise to build bone, but we don't say it the other way around, that not moving creates a loss of muscle mass, of capillaries and other blood vessels ready to move when we choose to, or even of bone density. Because why would bones that don't have to carry the load of the body much waste energy maintaining all of those minerals? The fact of the matter is childhood is training for how robust our adult bodies will be. This upcoming group of children will be the most sedentary we've ever seen, and there are consequences we might not have even imagined. Okay, but just to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here, schools still have gym class or physical education classes. Isn't having a dedicated movement class like PE enough? Well, PE is definitely a good start. There are many schools that don't offer any physical education. Just like a bout of exercise is a good start. But kid bodies are sculpting their tissues into how they'll be as adults. Kids need a lot of movement for all of the healths, not just the physical health. The human body is quite complex and movement is too. There are definitely benefits to organized movement, but also to unstructured movement or play. There are movements kids' bones need and movements their knees and hips need and movements their eyeballs need and lungs need and shoulders need. And if you were trying to get all the dietary nutrients you needed in a small, single meal, you couldn't do it. There's just too many nutrients. So in the same way, kids' movement diets need to be much bigger than they are now and include a lot of different movement foods, consumed throughout the day. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, I don't encourage my adult listeners to do a killer workout first thing in the morning and then sit still for the next 23 hours. Kids also need more than one specific dose of movement. That makes sense. Now, in the past, in this podcast and other places, I've referenced your analogy of how the movement we do can be viewed in a similar way to the food we eat. Now, did I actually mention to the listeners out there, Katie's website and business is actually called Nutritious Movement? So, okay, why do you feel that it's so valuable for society to start seeing movement as nutrition? So we are more informed about dietary nutrition than we are movement. So I'm sort of capitalizing on this framework to make understanding how movement works easier. But also what happens in the body's cells when you move them is a similar process to what happens in the cells when you eat particular foods. So when you put in a chemical compound, so that would be what's contained in food, so let's say a vitamin, that compound changes the biochemistry of certain cells in your body. And similarly, each movement we do bends and squishes the cells in a particular way. And when those cells move, it turns that cellular movement, the cells themselves turn that cellular movement into biochemistry. So dietary nutrients aren't the only nutrients that we Accept. We've accepted that sunlight also makes a particular biochemistry in the body. And until we recognize that movement does too, it will be harder to prioritize it at a cultural level. So movement can feel frivolous to many because the consequences from not moving, they occur too far down the line to really tie them together, the issue that you're experiencing and the lack of a particular movement. If I don't eat, my stomach will grumble as a signal. And I've been taught that this is a signal of movement hunger. And from learning my own body's signals, being taught them, given that framework, I can learn how to better feed myself. We have no framework for signs of movement hunger. So we have many different names for these signs. And it divorces them from our body's need to move. Yeah, that makes so much sense. 
And you know what? It's only now in my late 40s that I'm actually identifying those stiff joints and aches in my legs as being a cry for more movement. Hopefully it's not too late for me. (laughs) Now, okay, I never like to let a podcast guest leave without giving the listeners some immediately useful tips. Now, with that in mind, what are three ways that parents and alloparents can start modeling and participating in a more movement-rich lifestyle right now? All right, so one, that place you normally drive to, take it on foot or via some rolling activity. And if it feels too far to go, then drive part way and choose active transportation the rest of the distance. Um, You can look at your next celebration and take it outside or create a movement-rich theme or or add some uh, element of movement to it. Because again, as I said in Grow Wild, celebrations at their root um, have always been nature and movement-rich. They've always been dynamic processes. So, I mean, and then frankly, like even eating your dinner outside in the backyard or at at a local park is a simple way to get not only you, but your kids up out of the chair, off the devices, and they add simply a dose of movement and nature to your next meal. And finally, notice your tendencies to ask kids to just stop moving. Kids come as bouncy things for a reason. That bounce is in their best interest. It's us accommodated to sitting that want them to adjust their computer programs that come to input tons of movement to their betterment. We want them to shut that off so it matches ours often so that we can continue to not move to deal with them. So reframe that. See that as a good thing and also see it as a way that is a signal that maybe you need to be moving with them more too. I love it. Those are some great tips, and I hope my listeners will take them to heart. And to also take to heart that Katie's book, Grow Wild, The Whole Child, Whole Family, Nature-Rich Guide to Moving More, is available now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook, for which I'm sure you podcast lovers out there will enjoy. And here's a little spoiler. You may actually hear my voice, yours truly, pop up on occasion in the audiobook as well. So maybe that's another reason for you to check it out. But it is a gorgeous book full of great photos, great info, and I encourage all you parents and allo parents out there to check it out. And I'll put links to everything in the show notes over at quickanddirtytips.com slash getfitguy. Now, one more great big thank you to Katie for coming on the podcast yet again to enlighten us and fill our heads with some great information. So thank you, Katie. And don't forget to check out her book, but also her website at nutritiousmovement.com. All right. My name is Brock Armstrong. I'm the Get Fit Guy asking you, what are you waiting for? Get out there with your family and move more in nature. <laughs>